the city really came together on behalf of the Pacers. The convention center was donated, space was donated there, uh, Arby's donated food. Uh, players came in and manned the telephone lines to take pledges for people. Kids were literally going around their neighborhoods with piggy banks collecting money to bring in for the Pacers. People were invited to come in and entertain. The telephone ran for 16 hours from the evening of July 3rd of 77 till the afternoon of the 4th, about 16 hours. Three of the four local television stations ran at least part of it. You can imagine that, just getting rid of your national programming and televising this local telethon all at the same time. So people had to watch it. And it was just incredible looking back on it. And they got it done. You know, whatever number of tickets they had to sell, pledges for, or whatever money they had to raise, uh, they got it done and saved the franchise. So something like that had never happened before, and I don't think will ever happen again. Welcome to Good Seats Still Available, a curious little podcast devoted to exploring what used to be in professional sports. Here's your host, Tim Hanlon. Hey, gang, I hope it's uh, warmer where you are than where I am in the wilds of suburban Chicago. Uh, welcome. It's Good Seats Still Available, that curious little podcast that is devoted to what used to be in professional sports. My name's Tim Hanlon. I am your humble host, and I appreciate you finding us uh, in podcast land uh, for another exciting journey into what used to be uh, in pro sports. And uh, we are going to go back to our uh, conversation uh, about the uh, Indiana Pacers. Uh, our friend Mark Monteith, uh, the author of Reborn, The Pacers and the Return of Pro Basketball to Indianapolis, uh, was such a hit uh, in our earlier episode uh, in December, uh, actually, that is episode number 41, uh, if you didn't get a chance to listen to it, uh, we kind of ended at uh, the sort of second year of the Indiana Pacers ABA journey, uh, which dovetails very uh, nicely with uh, Mark's book, Reborn, uh, which literally uh, details those first two uh, wild and crazy years, not only of uh, the franchise in, in uh, Indiana, Indianapolis, uh, but also the uh, league, the ABA, the American Basketball Association itself. Uh, I felt uh, that we need to go back, though, to uh, tell the rest of the ABA and first year of the NBA story uh, of the Pacers. And uh, sure enough, uh, Mark was not only uh, uh, gracious to uh, come back, and we're going to have this conversation in a few seconds, which you'll hear, uh, but he is also uh, contemplating actually more than that, uh, doing indeed uh, the rest of the years uh, as another book. I do highly encourage you, though, to not only listen to that previous episode, but uh, the book, Reborn, The Pacers and the Return of Pro Basketball to Indianapolis, uh, literally is uh, uh, an amazing set of uh, detail and stories, uh, anecdotes, memories, et cetera, of those first two years. Mark has done a ton of research and has been around that team, the Pacers, uh, in many of its uh, incarnations for many years, perhaps uh, uh, more so than any other uh, beat reporter and or writer uh, than anybody in Indianapolis uh, history. So uh, we wanted to give sort of fuller fledge to uh, the rest of the uh, ABA slash early NBA story of the Pacers. And, you know, it's uh, it's it's absolutely uh, a wonderful opportunity to do so, uh, and we took advantage of it. So we're going to do that in just a few minutes with our guest, our return guest, Mark Monteith, uh, in just a couple of seconds. So thank you, and stay tuned for that. Uh, a couple of promotional notes to get out of the way uh, as we uh, continue our journey into 2018. Together, we want to thank our uh, friends at Audible, uh, the audiobook service who uh, continues to uh, delight us with their sponsorship, and we thank them amazingly uh, to do so. And we encourage you, of course, if you have not tried out audiobooks for yourself, uh, there is no easier way to do that than by going to our little website, audibletrial.com slash goodseats to get your free audiobook download and a taste of the service for a month uh, when you go to audibletrial.com slash goodseats. Uh, to uh, give it a spin for yourself. There are now over 185,000 titles, I'm told, uh, and that number continues to grow by leaps and bounds. You will not uh, be challenged to find something that will be interesting to you uh, to uh, burn one of those titles off for your free trial and your free one-month subscription to the Audible service. That's audibletrial.com slash goodseats. Uh, you can cancel at any time 
and uh, audiobooks are uh, amazing and fun and great way to pass the time uh, along with podcasts such as this one. So give it a try. We appreciate you doing so. Audibletrial.com slash goodseats. Try it now. Free uh, one month subscription, if you will, to the Audible service as well as a free audiobook download uh, to enjoy. Uh, also, we are brought to you by the good graces of our friend Dean Mitchell and his site, SportsHistoryCollectibles.com. SportsHistoryCollectibles.com, that is the place for uh, amazing memorabilia, whether that be uh, media guides or programs or schedules or buttons or pennants, you name it. Uh, SportsHistoryCollectibles.com has it from teams and leagues that uh, still exist today and many, many more that, for whatever reason, as we love here on this show, do not exist uh, today. Uh, use the promo code GOODSEATS uh, for a 15% discount on all your purchases at SportsHistoryCollectibles.com. And again, our thanks to Dean Mitchell, the proprietor of said site, and uh, some amazing stuff, new stuff every week that goes up there. And the imagery alone is well worth the checking out. But uh, of course, uh, you should indeed take a look at uh, making a purchase that's, uh, of such as well. I guarantee you, you will find something that will be interesting to you and will not gnaw at you to make that uh, that purchase. Again, sportshistorycollectibles.com. It's a fun site. And again, if you're fi- you find something that's of interest to you that you'd like to have, make sure you use the promo code GOODSEATS at checkout for 15% off. Okay, let's uh, segue nice and smoothly into our second and uh, very detailed and interesting conversation with our friend Mark Monteith. Uh, He, the author of Reborn, The Pacers, and the Return of Pro Basketball to Indianapolis. And we get into more NBA, actually the first year of the NBA, but prior, the uh, amazing years of the ABA version of the Pacers uh, in our conversation. Coming right up. So we, when we last left off, we were uh, kind of at the uh, the tail end of the second season, uh, which is where your uh, where your book sort of uh, 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 trails off and kind of sets the scene sort of for what is to, to come later. Um, I thought it was also interesting too because uh, the end of that season, um, this is the uh, 1968-69 season, uh, the Pacers made it all the way to the championship series against the uh, completely resurgent Oakland Oaks, and I'm not sure you got a chance to listen to our. Uh, our episode over the holidays, but we had the uh, the pleasure of being able to uh, talk with uh, Oakland Oaks owner Pat Boone and his reminiscences of uh, his two year adventure, shall we say? Uh, but clearly, you know, you, you here's a here's a team in the Pacers that uh, is is absolutely on the ascendance, and and it seems to me that the third season of their existence, the um, sixty nine seventy season, was uh, ostensibly their uh, their greatest season, certainly. Uh, up to that point, and perhaps even uh, in the ABA uh, recollection of their of their years, perhaps their best uh, overall. Yeah, I think that was the year they were the most dominant in the league. You know, they had their nucleus, championship nucleus, and while their later championship teams, when they added George McGinnis, were probably better teams, I think the Pacers were farther ahead of the league in the sixty nine seventy season. They really dominated. The ABA was still fledgling and there were some pretty bad teams in the league and uh, the Pacers really dominated. So they didn't have too much trouble really in 69, 70. As you look back on them, they really should have won the championship that year. Uh, Bill Sharman was a great coach and he had the LA stars playing as well as they could play, but the Pacers just had far more talent than LA did that year. Well, uh, aside from uh, the nucleus uh, of the team returning in, in, in Messrs. Brown and Lewis and Daniels, and, and obviously uh, Neto was back, uh, you had uh, an NBA veteran who had kind of crossed uh, crossed the lines, and a guy named John Barnhill, um, and frankly also a, a, a well-known rookie in, in, the, uh, in the person of Billy Keller, who I guess was pretty well known for three throw and, uh, and, and his prowess behind the three-point line. It seems to me that those were kind of like two of the sort of uh, – I don't know, spark plugs are missing ingredients, I guess, of an already strong nucleus of a team. Yeah, yeah. The Pacers were good about adding some NBA veterans in those days. You mentioned John Barnhill. They also uh, had added Tom Thacker the year before. And Thacker was on the 69-70 team as well. Later years, they added Gus Johnson for their 72-73 championship team. So they made some pretty uh, smart pickups uh, to bring in experienced players to play off the bench in those years. And, and Billy Keller was a really important guy, you know, more really one of the more underrated pacers. I would say he is one of 
four players who were on all three championship teams, 70, 72, and 73. Keller was a rookie on the 69-70 team. Um, you know, he was a seventh-round draft pick, both ABA and NBA. He was not he was well known in Indiana because he was on the Purdue team that reached the championship game at the NCAA tournament in 1969, losing to UCLA. Uh, but Rick Mount was the All American on that team, the guy who averaged more than 30 points a game. Keller was a point guard who sacrificed a lot of scoring to uh, set up Mount and Herm Gilliam, who was on that team and had a 12 year NBA career. So Keller, you know, went underappreciated, uh, below the radar kind of player, even though he was the Naismith Award winner. You know, but he was the first winner of the Naismith Award, which goes to the best player in the country under six foot tall. So Keller was in Indiana's Mr. Basketball in 65. You know, he was out of high school. His team won a state championship. He was well known, but still was not given a great opportunity to even make the team. Uh, obviously, the Pacers didn't think so. They would have drafted him higher if they thought he could. So he wound up. Uh, you know, not being absolutely crucial to that team, but he was really important uh, to that team and even more so to the later championship teams. Now, we, we uh, talked uh, in our previous episode uh, when uh, the sort of second season of uh, of the team was around. Uh, that's when Slick uh, Leonard sort of, uh, I guess, at the beginning of that, uh, around the beginning of that season uh, kind of came in. But this is this season, 69-70, uh, was really his first sort of uh, uh, start to finish um, imprint, I guess, on the team. And I'm just curious as to how much he was able to more uh, flex his muscles, uh, either in terms of the personnel that was uh, coming in and or staying, uh, as well as his uh, impact on the his desire for tempo of the game and, and uh, you know, under completely his own control. Yeah, he did take more control, no question. One thing he had said at the end of that 68-69 season, uh, when they reached the ABA Finals, uh, he kind of left it open. Well, I'm not sure if I'm coming back or not. You know, he had just signed a contract for that year, uh, taking over nine games into the season. And uh, he said, one thing I know for sure, though, if I'm coming back, you know, I'm going to have more control over personnel matters. And apparently got that. Uh, you know, Mike Storn was the general manager, and Storn did a good job. And, and But he was good, I think, about giving the coach a lot of freedom and putting together the roster he wanted to coach. So uh, the Pacers made, you know, a lot of moves that year. Slick was, uh, he, <laughs> he would, uh, he had to be controlled. In, in fact, you know, he liked to make uh, moves on the spur of the moment or he'd get mad and uh, want to trade somebody, whatever. Storm had to talk him off some ledges, you know, let's talk about it in the morning, that kind of thing. But Slick, without question, had more control over the roster and having a training camp with these guys, he was able to, uh, like you say, have an imprint from the very beginning. And uh, they reflected that, you know, they won 59 games that year, 59 and 25 in an 84 game season. And, uh, you know, he, they got off to a great start and they rolled all the way through the season. Well, it's interesting to take a quick pause on uh, on Slick for a, sec, uh, for a second. I mean, uh, Slick Leonard, uh, I, I, without saying it in so many words, it, it, I get the sense he's sort of a, um, I don't know, maybe a, a controlled hothead, so to speak, right? And there's a famous incident uh, in uh, 72, I think it was, 72 or 73, certainly that season, um, where, and there's some famous uh, pictures of it too, where uh, he apparently kicks the ball into the stands against uh, what, what then became a, a pretty heated rival with the uh, with the Utah Stars when they got realigned uh, in an early season game. I guess he got a couple of technicals and he got fined and 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 it it, it almost became kind of uh, uh, symbolic, I guess, of his uh, fiery nature, at least on the court, uh, genuine or not, as it might have been uh, uh, overall. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He had incidents that if they happened today uh, would get him suspended for a long time. You know, <laughs> it's amazing, really kind of what he got away with back then. He did kick a ball into the stands in Utah. Uh, there was a game, a home game, where he d took the ball rack and just shoved it out on the floor and the balls are bouncing every which way. Uh, he would occasionally put his hands on a referee. Uh, he would say things in the newspaper that, you know, <laughs> you would really get in trouble for today. Like in 75, they're playing San Antonio in a playoff series. And he said something along along the lines of, hey, if Bob Bass walks across that midcourt line, I'm going to deck him, you know, this kind of thing. Uh, in my book, there's a quote 
from the second year where he says, Hey, if they want to fight, we'll fight this type of thing. So he, uh, he was, um, very temperamental. Uh, some of it was for show, I think. And he's known as a really good guy. And as, as soon as the game was over, you know, everything was forgotten. Uh, he and his wife, Nancy used to have parties at their house, you know, and they would invite the referees and the members of the opposing team and this kind of thing. So, um, it was just kind of all, within the confines of the game, but that certainly set the tone for his players and they followed suit, you know, to have this fighting spirit. But uh, yeah, Slick got away with things back then that are just totally unheard of today. And while he did take some fines, no question about it, uh, you know, there would be far more severe penalties today for some of the things he got away with. A couple of interesting things in that 69-70 uh, season, um, uh, one of which was, I, I think, uh, the still a standing record. Well, obviously, the ABA didn't exist past 76, but uh, a record for points in one game against the Pittsburgh Pipers, um, 177 to 135. I, I just can't mm-hmm. imagine that today, uh, just a up and down, a, a clearly a, a non-defensive game, but uh, it almost sounds like uh, some of the old classic uh, ABA, excuse me, NBA All-Star games in terms of uh, no defense, but... Um, uh, it, it was, I was at that game. Okay, and and so yeah. at what point did you know you were on to something that went, uh, was notable in history? <laughs> uh, oh, man, uh, you know, like you said, obviously no defense. And then you got guys, uh, you know, hitting three-pointers that have no business even taking three-pointers. Uh, you know, Pittsburgh was not very good. And the Pacers – you know, mucked it up by just giving up layups so they could get the ball back, that type of thing. That's another thing that they would be highly criticized for today if they dared uh, do that, you know, just uh, doing whatever they could to get more points. But people just didn't take it as seriously back then. They had scored the previous year, had scored 172 points in a game. So that wasn't the first time they got over – 170. So it's just amazing to think about that today, that that could happen, but it did, you know, it did. And, um, I don't remember a lot of details. I just remember, you know, guys like Nedelicki out there shooting three pointers and the game was kind of a joke, but, uh, but it was entertaining, you know, people got into that kind of thing. And, uh, the ABA was such a wild and free league that uh, people kind of got excited about stuff like that. People didn't really criticize it. People just thought it was entertaining. Well, and certainly by comparison to the NBA, which is a bit more staid and a little bit slow and, and a little more plotting, I guess, and, and obviously had all sort of that heritage of sort of the game sort of being a true cager kind of thing. I mean, do you think defenses, you know, in general in the ABA kind of got short shrift, not only uh, on the court, but uh, maybe in the annals of history or do you just think it was just the up-tempo sort of nature and, and an adjustment, frankly, um, versus the quality of defensive play? Yeah, defense wasn't then what it is now. You know, some people want you to believe that the NBA teams don't play defense now. You know, of course they do. You know, teams would get 200 points today if people didn't defend. Uh, the game... Uh, contrary to what those players might want to say, wasn't as physical then. You could get to the basket, not get do- knocked down as often. Certainly it was physical, and they had rugged players and, and that type of thing. But really there's more flow to the game, and fans probably would have appreciated that more you know, than what you see today with so many fouls and everything. But uh, you know, defense was not what it is today. You know, because – forget about these 177 point games. There were a lot of 130, 140 point games back then. And the three point shooting was not better than it is today. You know, you just look at the percentages, the, uh, nobody was shooting 40% from the three point line back then, like players do today. Um, even a guy like Rick Mount, one of the great shooters of all time was a 31% three point shooter as a pacer. And Roger Brown, you know, was a low thirties percentage three point shooter. So, um, it's not that they shot better. It's just that the defense wasn't as strong and the game was a little more up tempo and it was running gun, you know, it was a playground game back then. And then people enjoyed that. Also interesting that year was that the uh, all-star game came to Indianapolis. Was that a, a signal that, uh, the league, uh, found, uh, Indiana to be a, um, I don't know, I guess a model franchise or at least one where they were worthy of, uh, of hosting the game. Obviously there must've been some love by the owners, uh, to have the uh, third season's uh, All-Star game in Indianapolis. Yeah, well, the first season's All-Star game was here, 67-68, and the 
franchise had done a great job putting that on. They lost money on it. Uh, the Pacers lost like thirty thousand dollars on the All Star game the first year, but they got it uh, televised to many uh, major markets in the country, and it looked good on TV, even though the attendance wasn't nearly what they claimed it was, and uh, particularly the paid attendance. But it still televised well, and it was a really a good moment for the league to get the product exposed around the country. Uh, and the second one was in Louisville. And so they brought it back to Indianapolis for the third one, and they did have a national telecast for that one. I also attended that All-Star game as a fan, and it was a big deal. You know, any ABA game that was on national TV seemed like a really big deal back then, and, and the league needed the exposure so badly. Um, I believe that was a year there was a boycott that nearly uh, caused the cancellation or postponement. The players were starting to organize and wanted some kind of union representation. And there was a meeting and so forth, and they didn't take the court for warm-ups, you know, until late. But uh, still, the game went on, and it was a good show, and it all worked out. But it was kind of a, a near miss there. I mean, it was uh, it would have been obviously devastating if something like that happened. And the players knew it. I don't think they were going to boycott the game, but they were just trying to get a voice, get some representation, and you know, establish some kind of power within the league because the league was becoming established, and uh, the players, you know, wanted to participate in the development or the improvement of the ABA. Do you happen to remember who might have been broadcasting that game that season? Well, my guess would be Don Crickey. Um, he did a lot of the ABA games. He did the playoff games, I know. Uh, so that's my best guess. Because uh, I know he did, like when the Pacers played the LA Stars in 1970 in the finals, Don Crickey was doing games. And uh, I would uh, that's where I would guess first. I'm pretty sure it was him. Yeah, and and the broadcaster it wasn't. I doubt it was NBC, though, right? Uh, I'm wondering if uh, was, I know HBO broadcast a bunch of uh, of games in a couple of years afterwards. I know, like the uh, the famous uh, uh, dunk competition. I know was an HBO presentation, a fledgling HBO back then. Um, I guess we'll yeah. point out to our audience as to maybe uh, where that video can be found because uh, it would obviously be really cool to sort of see some of that uh, that stuff in action. And I know. Some of the ABA enthusiasts out there uh, discover some of these uh, tapes uh, on a regular basis and post them on YouTube. Yeah, they're out there. In fact, I know somebody here in town who's got one of the Pacer playoff games from, uh, I think it's the 73 season, has the game in its entirety with commercials and everything that he's invited me to watch with him. So things do surface now and then. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, and I don't know about 1970, though. I don't know if there's an entire game or not. Uh, because that's, you know, when Roger Brown had the peak moments of his career. And I know people like to see that stuff, but it uh, they were televised. I mean, you know, I remember staying up late for the games in L.A. to watch them. Uh, they were televised. And again, it was a huge deal for the ABA uh, and for the fans to have those games exposed like that. But um, a lot of it's gone. You know, as you know, the they people just didn't keep the tapes of that. You know, the film was expensive then. It wasn't videotape. It was stuff on film, and it got reused or thrown away, and a lot of history got lost. Well, the end of the, uh, that season, I mean, the, the Pacers uh, obviously winning the championship um, uh, in 69-70. Uh, not only did they win the championship, but it, it appears to me that they literally blitzed through the playoffs. I mean, they were they seem to be quite dominant and um, almost to the point of uh, it being almost a, a fait accompli, especially after that first uh, series sweep of Carolina and then a 4-1 series uh, uh, dismissing, if you will, of Kentucky. Yeah, they did. And that shows how dominant they were. Yeah, they swept Carolina the first round. They lost game one to Kentucky at home in overtime, then won the next four games um, without a whole, well, you know, they, they were reasonably close. But then they beat L.A. 4-2 to two for the championship. They sort of won it in five games. Uh, there's kind of a famous story from that. Uh, you know, the Pacers were up three to one. They're coming home with a chance to win the ABA championship on national television. Uh, I think it was CBS that was doing the games. Um, and the cameras are set up in the locker room. Champagne's on ice in the locker room. They're going to have this huge celebration uh, winning their first ABA title. And lo and behold, 
Bob Nedelik, he goes water skiing the day before the game. Uh, this game was played on a Saturday, I'm pretty sure. And Neto, on a Friday, it's you know warm, it's late in the year, and he goes water skiing with some friends. So he shows up for the game with sore, sore shoulders, sunburned, you know, and uh, he's shooting air balls out there because he's tight. And I think he went 7-22 to 22 from the field, something like that. And the Pacers lost. They lost this home game. It was a classic case of assuming too much, of uh, thinking you've got it made, and you know some pressure on yourself. So they had to go back to L.A. to win the series. And it was, you know, all three of the Pacer titles were, were won on the road, and this was one they should have won at home. But they just, uh, between Neto going water skiing and, and the players just not responding to the moment the, the best way, uh, they had to go back to L.A. and win it. Was Neto disciplined in any way, or was it just sort of a, a an assumption about uh, his uh, unique style and approach, shall we say, to playing the game of basketball? <laughs> no, I don't think he was disciplined. I don't think that it was known, you know, for a while that he had gone water skiing. You know, he had he was sunburned, but you know, as far as anyone knew, he had just spent time outdoors. And uh, I don't think it was really known the reason why he played poorly. He did have a lot of rebounds that game, but. You know, his shooting was so bad, but I'm sure he wasn't the only one who didn't play up to par. You know, I don't think uh, some other guys did as well. They just didn't handle the moment, really. But it's one of those things that had it come out then, you know, there would have been a lot of criticism for. But since they won the title and it comes out in later years, people just think it's funny. Let alone the insurance risk, right? Which is obviously a modern day. Uh, thing. You can imagine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't think you'd have. Just imagine today if a player, the day before a, a title clinching game in the NBA Finals, were to go out and go water skiing. Uh, can you imagine uh, the blowback on something like that? I mean, again, that's the ABA for you. That was just a different time. How did the uh, the city of Indianapolis uh, respond to the championship, right? This is a, a league that's been only around for three years, right? And we talked earlier in our episode 41, sort of in the uh, uh, the nascence uh, of the team, uh, the nascency of the team, the, uh, you know, the, the growing love affair and the, I guess, putting on the map of Indianapolis as a major city uh, with a professional franchise in the ABA. What was the, uh, what was the reaction? Was it a, a true... Uh, outpouring of emotion, or was it muted? Uh, what was the sort of response to, from the uh, from the fans of Indianapolis to the ch- this uh, championship in in seventy? Oh, people were excited. Yeah, no question. They treated it as if they'd won an NBA championship. You know, as far as people here were concerned, ABA was every bit as big a deal as the NBA, and this was our deal. And and people, you know, really got excited about it. People met the team at the airport when they flew back the next day. Um, of course, they're not flying charter then, so they stay overnight in L.A. and come back the next day, and people greet them out there. There was a parade uh, that I believe went from the team headquarters on 38th Street downtown uh, to the Circle, so 38 blocks. And they're later, they used to have these ham and bean dinners at the fairgrounds uh, to celebrate these championships like that. We're open to the public, maybe five bucks a person, that kind of thing. And it'd be televised. Um, so the city got really excited. Again, Indianapolis was wanting to get on the map, wanting to be a major league city. And this was something that everybody took a lot of pride in. You know, it was treated like a huge deal. And, uh, uh you know, I think, uh, as far as anybody here was concerned, it was every bit as big a deal as a Super Bowl or an NBA championship or a, you know World Series championship. Yeah, but with a bit a bit of a homespun uh, quality and goodness and, and gen, uh, genuineness, right? Uh, ham and beans. Can you imagine that in, in the city of New York? For- yeah, I know. Oh, I know. I know. Isn't that something? I think they had sponsorship, and I remember watching it on television. You know, it was. Uh, they televised the thing. It's a shame there's no tape of that. I think it would be hilarious to see today. The only thing I remember from their postseason banquet, uh, Mel Daniels and Nedelicki used to kind of go as a tag team. You know, this is kind of yin and yang, two guys who were opposites who became good friends. And they would, when, you know, players would all get up and take their turn at the microphone and they'd go up together and uh, kind of just do almost a comedy routine, you know, like uh, uh, Mel would say, you go ahead, Neto, and, and Neto would say, oh, that's awfully white of you, Mel, you know, that kind of thing, and joking around, and, uh, you know, so it was, it was something that was good for the city, I think, uh, it just uh, made the city feel good, you know, about being a championship city. 
Well, they were certainly drawing very well as uh, well. They were clearly stable, and uh, it's uh, it, it by comparison to some of the other uh, hijinks around the league, uh, a uh, probably a, a good thing for everyone involved, not only in Indianapolis but also uh, in the league itself, to have a, a real uh, example of stability and success, and um, you know, uh, and uh, portending well, hopefully for the future. But it's uh, interesting in the off season, though. Uh, arguably one of the architects of of that success, the general manager, Mike Storen, uh, resigns to go to Kentucky. Why, why would you leave a situation like that uh, to go to another franchise uh, uh, given all that success? He got an offer he couldn't refuse, basically. He got a piece of ownership by the Colonels. You know, Storen had been in many ways the architect of the Pacers championship team in 70. And, uh, you know, he was an ambitious guy. And the uh, colonel's called with uh, just an offer he could not refuse. One of the funny stories related to that is that uh, when he went in to clean out his desk in Indianapolis, uh, I, and I guess before he had officially signed his contract with the colonels, he wrote a letter addressed to the general manager of the Kentucky colonels proposing that the Pacers and colonels play uh, like an eight game exhibition series the following season, just to save money, you know, to play a, a bunch of exhibition games against one another. Then when he got down to Kentucky and signed his contract and um, assumed that role, he responded to that letter and accepted the offer. And what do you know, the two teams played like an eight game exhibition series the next fall. So he uh, played it from both ends, but were they natural rivals, uh, the Colonels and, and the Pacers? I mean, certainly regionally uh, on the map, it looks like it, they could have been. Yeah, no question. You know, two hours apart, the, um, called the I-65 series, Interstate 65, uh, separates Indianapolis and Louisville by the two-hour drive. And for that reason, we're absolutely natural rivals. And a lot of Pacer fans would go down, uh, particularly those in southern Indiana, would go down to Louisville for games. Uh, the Pacers would often organize bus trips for 10 bucks, whatever. You get a ticket to the game and a box of lunch, that kind of thing. And uh, so it was a great rivalry, yeah. Well, it's interesting, too, because uh, as that season uh, uh, came about, 70-71, uh, there was realignment. And uh, in Indianapolis, uh, or the Indiana Pacers uh, actually went to the Western Division uh, and uh, almost immediately uh, uh, were meet, uh, met by uh, what became, uh, oddly, not geographically, certainly, a, a new rival pretty quickly in the Utah Stars. Um, do, you, do you think the... Um, uh, the realignment had any positive or negative effects either for the Pacers or uh, that rivalry with the Colonels or or the league, or was it just simply dealing with uh, the realities of a certain amount of teams and having to just place them in an even way across the country? No, that was another thing that was manipulated. Uh, when Storen got down there, uh, he and the Pacer leadership, probably Dick Tinkham, the team's legal counsel, they were good friends. They had been in the military together, Marines. They got together and arranged this so that the colonels and pacers would meet in the finals. You know, they were considered, if not the two strongest franchises, two of them. Uh, and so they kind of manipulated it on their own so that the pacers and colonels would not have to meet before the finals. And uh, that was another thing Storen arranged to do. I mean, the ABA, you could do that kind of thing. Then there was really, I guess you'd say, a lack of leadership at the top. And a couple guys could get together, and I'm sure they had to convince, you know, other owners or whatever. But they kind of manipulated that whole thing to get the Pacers out west. It didn't really make sense geographically, but they just wanted to separate the Pacers and Colonels so that uh, they wouldn't bump heads in the early rounds of the playoffs. Well, that's, and that's very. Uh, I don't know if it were. What's that? I said that's very interesting. I mean, the fact that they would go to that, oh, that yeah. to kind of break up a, a, what I would imagine would be a great rivalry if they would meet on a regular basis, right, to intensify it, but apparently not. Yeah, well, they met uh, a lot during the regular season, and uh, so the rivalry was strong, and they did wind up, of course, meeting for the championship in 1973 and again in 1975, but, uh, you know, that was the whole plan, you know, and again, Storm's very upfront about that today, you know, that, uh, uh, you know, let's just uh, spread this out, you know, so that uh, the Pacers and Colonels won't have to meet too early, that we both have a good chance to get to the finals. Um, so going into that season, uh, which obviously was not as uh, successful as the season prior, um, another, and we sort of hinted at this uh, in our uh, previous episode, that'd be episode number 41 for those who have not listened to our first 
uh, uh, interview with uh, with Mark, uh, please, by all means, uh, pause this one and go back to that episode or, or, or as soon as this one is done, go right back and, uh, and download and listen to it. Um, but I do want to touch on it again because it, it more evidence of it comes comes about uh, not only in this season, but in a few more seasons. Um, is uh, their use of the draft and or uh, uh, to be able to bring in rookies uh, from local uh, schools, right? In this case, this year, uh, as we uh, mentioned earlier, uh, the draft pick being Rick Mount from um, from Purdue. Um, uh, not only talking about Mount and his uh, sort of contribution, I guess, this season and, and a few seasons thereafter, but uh, maybe you can kind of remind our listeners as to sort of the uh, – the, the rationale about uh, sticking to uh, having a, a fair amount of local uh, rookie and or collegiate product uh, in the Pacers uh, organization. And and was that indicative, by the way, of just their uh, the Pacers unique ability to kind of find and, and and stoke interest on the local level? Or was that something that other ABA teams were also doing too? that sort of geographical kind of uh, tie in with uh, with new uh, and rookie talent? Yeah, I think other ABA teams did it. The ABA was so focused on mere survival that there were basically no rules. You know, we've talked about, you know, splitting the Pacers and Colonels east and west and and things like that. Uh, And, you know, the Pacers won the championship in 1970 and were still able to sign Rick Mount, not because they had a draft pick, you know, for when Rick Mount was available. Obviously, as a first-team All-American, he would have gone very, very high. Uh, if you had the ability to sign a player, you just did it. You know, the other teams in the league didn't care. It was whatever great college player you could bring into the league, bring him in by all means. Don't worry about the draft. You know, the ABA had a draft, but it was almost a joke because the Pacers obviously would not have been able to draft Rick Mount, who was a two-time first-team All-American, uh, if you had a normal draft like you have today where you go in inverse order of the, your regular season record. So the Pacers added Rick Mount and people need to understand while I'm not a big name today to younger fans in Indiana in 1970, he was the biggest name. He had been Mr. Basketball in 1966. He was on the cover of sports illustrated the first uh, team sport high school athlete to be on the cover of sports illustrated. I think there had been some Olympic swimmers or so forth who had been the Rick Mount, a story by Frank DeFord uh, was the cover boy in 1966. And that was as big a thing that could possibly happen uh, to an athlete in 1966, uh, being on the cover of SI. And so he has this great career at Purdue. And it seemed perfect for the Pacers because they had four set positions. You had a point guard in Freddie Lewis. You had a small forward in Roger Brown, a power forward in Bob Nedelecki, and a center in Mel Daniels. They just needed a shooting guard to go with them and preferably a three point shooter to add to that mix. And Mount seemed perfect because he was the best shooter in the country. Uh, And so they added him and there was huge excitement about that. He actually signed his contract on a live television broadcast here in Indianapolis. Uh, And uh, you know, that's how big a deal it was. They televised it. And uh, the, the, bad news about that, the thing that people didn't pick up at the time, is that Slick Leonard didn't attend. He didn't go. He uh, did not want Mount to be signed. He was against it because uh, he didn't think Rick fit in uh, to his style of coaching. Uh, I don't think he, he just didn't like Mount as a personality and didn't think he was needed. Uh, but this is a case where Storm overruled him. And said, you know, look, we need this guy to sell tickets. He's going to sell tickets like crazy. So they signed him, and Mount wound up playing two seasons for the Pacers. But it turned out to be a, a happy, uh, an unhappy experience for all concerned. That's well, very interesting, right? So two quick questions on that, and again, more uh, projecting sort of generally. Um, so what I think I hear you saying is there wasn't any sort of ironclad or written, shall we call it, territorial strategy by the ABA or its teams. It was more of a Heck, uh, you're closer to those uh, regional situations, and if you can get those players, especially given, uh, you know, obviously a competition for talent coming out of college with the NBA, go get them, right? Yeah. Like, you know, Kentucky signed Dan Issel, for example. The Colonels added Dan Issel. 
and uh, you could go around different parts of the league. Uh, but basically, the, the ABA just wanted every great college player it could get its hands on, and whatever team had the means of signing that player, it went out and did it. You know, and you know the Colonels later signed Artis Gilmore, and Mike Storns kind of told me the story behind that. But uh, that wasn't regional, but they had the means of doing it. The the ownership had the money to do it. So by all means, please go do it. You know, we it was all about survival for the ABA. Well, okay, and am I am I projecting here that uh, that possibly there were some uh, shall we say clandestine efforts to ensure uh, some of those signings? Because I mean, I think as you hinted before. You know, an ABA draft, you know, arguably perhaps even after or before, or even, you know, against the NBA, uh, it, it feels to me that as a fledgling, you know, only three plus year old league, uh, shall we say, other means might have to be explored in order to secure some of this talent versus sort of the more traditional ways uh, of getting that talent. Yeah, I think that's fair to say. I think that's fair to say. Yeah, no question. Any uh, a- any stories that you remember, perhaps, of maybe uh, things or untoward or curious as to how people might have been discovered or found or, or onboarded before uh, uh, more traditional methods of, of drafting and or uh, signing? Um, well, I think I think with the uh, yeah regarding the Pacers, I don't think that uh, you know, for example, the Pacers signed you know Rick Mountain seventy and George McGinnis in seventy one and. Um, I don't uh, think they were slipping money to them or anything like that, but they're, I think those players knew, you know, during their season, their final college season that the Pacers wanted them, you know, and that they had that opportunity. Um, I think with, in the case of the Colonels and Artis Gilmore, there had been conversations throughout his last season down in Jacksonville. And, uh, you know, Mike Storns told me the story that there's an all night negotiation with Gilmore uh, like before Christmas, you know, when he signed, when they agreed to a contract, you know, so there were things like that going on throughout the league. And probably, you know, for all we know in the NBA as well, it was just a much, um, less defined time. So shall we say, uh, just, uh, I don't know what the rules were, but, you know, certainly there was a lot going on behind the scenes in those days to get players lined up. Well, Mel Daniels had a superstar season, right? He was uh, the MVP of the league, and, uh, and Larry Brown uh, clearly uh, uh, continuing his uh, his dominance that uh, he uh, exhibited in the playoff series before by being a first-team All-Star. Um, but, of course, they did uh, not replicate the success that they had the year before uh, and lost to uh, the eventual champions, their newfound rivals in the Utah Stars, who uh, they apparently just beat out in the new alignment uh, during the regular season to kind of win – um, uh, their division or, or the p- playoff position in that. So um, not necessarily a bad season by comparison, but uh, but clearly not uh, the heights of the of the year before. Um, but as, as we segue, you mentioned uh, yet another local product in George McGinnis, right, who comes in uh, that next season, a, a pretty large contract. Um, and he, of course, was uh, transformative and, and arguably, I guess he's a he's a Naismith, uh, Naismith Hall of Famer as well. Um, perhaps a little, a uh, few notes on, on George McGinnis and his impact. Uh, he of, uh, Indiana coming into the team. Yes. George, you know, was just an incredibly dominant high school player. He was Indiana's Mr. Basketball in 69. You know, we've talked about, you know, you can see the nucleus, the Pacers are building. They have Billy Keller, who is Mr. Basketball in 65, Rick Mount from 66. Now George McGinnis, who is Mr. Basketball in 69, uh, joins the team and he had, Gone to Indiana. He was just an incredibly dominant high school player. Led his team to an undefeated season and state championship. They have Indiana has an annual high school all star series with Kentucky. Play two games every June. And McGinnis in the second game of that series in '69 had scored something like 53 points and grabbed 30 rebounds. You know that tells you how dominant he was. And he went to IU. Freshmen were not eligible for varsity competition at that time. As a sophomore at IU, averaged 30 points and 15 rebounds a game and uh, was like a third-team All-American, something like that, Uh, first-team All-Big Ten. And he needs to get to the pros because his father had been killed in a construction accident. His summer after his high school year in high school after his senior year in high school excuse me um had been killed in a construction accident he fell off a scaffolding downtown and so 
George's mother now has to support George and his sister. Uh, she's taking in ironing and things like that. They didn't get much of an insurance settlement out of it. So George wants to earn money as quickly as can as he can. And after his sophomore year at IU, signs with the Pacers. And he was ready. You know, he was so physically advanced that he was ready for the pros even at that age. So, you know, he's joining a team that really was already the best in the league. Even though the Pacers didn't win the title in 71, they had had the best record in the regular season and really kind of blew it. In fact, you know, if to backtrack a little bit, you know, Slick Leonard kind of messed around with the starting lineup in that series with Utah in 1971 and uh, probably cost the Pacers a championship in that regard. At least some of the players feel that way. But anyway, you're adding George McGinnis to a team that's already probably the most talented in the league. And uh, it was almost too good to be true for the Indiana fans. You got Billy Keller, Rick Mount, and George McGinnis, and Mel Daniels, and Roger Brown, and Freddie Lewis, and Bob Nedelicki. I mean, it, it truly was that first year too much talent for one roster to contain. You know, they developed some issues as the year went on with, you know, trying to keep everybody happy with playing time. But George McGinnis was, just think of Carl Malone or LeBron James. He was along those lines. He was obviously younger and less disciplined, but still that kind of physical freak of nature who uh, could dominate a game all by himself. And he joins this team that already is superior. And uh, it didn't take him too long before we started uh, dominating in the ABA as well. Okay, friends, sorry for the interruption. Just wanted to quickly remind you that today's episode of Good Seat Still Available is brought to you by our friends at Audible, the premier provider of digital audiobooks with over 180,000 titles to choose from in just about every genre you could think of. Audible titles play on iPhone, Kindle, Android, and more than 500 devices and MP3 players for listening anytime, anywhere. And for a limited time, my audience can listen to a free download of any book that they choose, as well as get a 30-day free trial when you go to audibletrial.com slash goodseats. That's audibletrial.com slash goodseats. And you can choose from over 180,000 titles, as we said, including uh, one that I'm listening to right now. It's called The Ten Gallon War by John Eisenberg. That's the story of the NFL's Cowboys, the AFL's Texans, and the feud for Dallas's pro football future. Um, another one on my list, which I have yet to download, but is on my queue uh, that could be interesting to our audience here is called The National Forgotten League by Dan Daly. Entertaining stories and observations from pro football's first 50 years. Those are just two of the many thousands of titles to choose from, and not just in sports history, but you name the genre that uh, you might want to listen to, and Audible's got it. By the way, two uh, two guests, perhaps, that we'll have on the show, hopefully sometime soon. But again, go to audibletrial.com slash goodseats for your free 30-day trial, as well as your free audiobook download to try it out for yourself. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash goodseats. And now, back to our conversation. All right, besides McGinnis, who obviously went on to a, a, a gigantic uh, career in the ABA, in the NBA, obviously a Hall of Famer, and we'll get to a few more of his exploits in, in a, couple of, a couple of seconds, uh, I do want to take a, a great note for uh, a player that I came to love uh, when he went on to the New Jersey NBA Nets. Uh, when I was growing up as a kid at the old Rutgers Athletic Center, uh, for people who remember those days before the then Brendan Burns slash Meadowlands Arena, Darnell Hillman. And not only for his ah. play, known as, uh, I guess his nickname was uh, Dr. Dunk, right? So I think in many respects, at least this is my personal belief, you're the more the pro and uh, we're there for some of this stuff. I would argue uh, that Darnell, Darnell Hillman, um, arguably maybe one of the most uh, underappreciated or underrated uh, players, especially when it comes to the idea of dunking, which I think Dr. J really kind of inherited with that 76 uh, all-star game performance. But before Dr. J was kind of doing his thing, I think it was really Darnell Hillman with he of the flowing fro. Um, his, uh, his hair was obviously well known around the league too. Uh, I would argue that he was kind of more, perhaps more the pioneer uh, in the sort of uh, era of the dunk, shall we say? Yeah, I agree. You know, you're talking about a six foot nine guy 
who was a seven foot high jumper. You know, most guys that tall, you know, aren't, don't have great vertical jumps, but Darnell did, you know, he, uh, was on the track team at San Jose state, uh, with John Carlos, for example, of Olympic fame. And he even tells the story how on his first day as a freshman in college, he's over there, he'd gone six foot six in high school. And he's over there practicing high jump bit, you know, working on his form, looking pretty, clearing the bar at six six. And Carlos ran over and grabbed him by a shirt and threatened him, saying, "God dang, you put that bar at seven feet and start knocking it off. You know, set your goals higher. Don't be showing everybody what you can do. You got to try harder. You set that bar at seven feet." And Darnell did, and lo and behold, in his first meet as a freshman, cleared seven feet. Yeah, and uh, kind of taught him a lesson right there about goal setting and all kinds of things. And so you're talking about a guy who's already tall, who is a great jumper, a trained jumper, not just a guy with natural hops. He's trained uh, his body to be a jumper. He had been in the Army for a couple of years. He got drafted into the Army. In fact, he tells a story. He's on a bus uh, in the Army when somebody on the bus says, He's looking at the newspaper, says, Darnell, you just got drafted. He says, what are you talking about? I'm already in the Army. And it turned out the Pacers had drafted him. There was something in the newspaper about that. He didn't even know, you know, anything about the Pacers or whatever. So he joins the team the same year as George McGinnis, and they are great friends to this day. You're talking about, you know, two pretty colorful guys, two great additions, two great personalities to the team. George, as great as he was, was a humble guy who respected the older players, respected authority, and you know, he had had a strong father. And uh, so he's a great addition. And Darnell, same thing. Darnell's a great personality. Darnell was great in that he didn't mind being kind of a supplemental guy. You know, he didn't see himself as a star. He had the discipline of being in the Army. You know, to this day, Darnell Hillman works for the Pacers in their front office in community relations. And he's, you know, just another guy with a cubicle doing his job, does a great job day to day, great meeting the public, great getting out of the community, doing different events. And Darnell was a perfect addition for that team that already had all these star players. But the fans loved him because, uh, again, his jumping ability, he was a great dunker. And beyond that, he had the afro. You know, he had the best afro in the league, and he took great care of it. You know, he combed it out every day. You know, it was neatly um, neatly attended to. Uh, he tells the story that, you know, Slick ordered him to get it cut, and he got a little bit trimmed off, and he kind of tried to smash it down, you know, a little bit, and Slick – you know, got on him again about getting a cut. He said, Slick, come on now. I take good care of this afro. It, it's not sloppy or anything. And you don't tell the white guys to cut their hair. <laughs> so there's nothing wrong with this, you know, and Slick let it go. So he, you know, was just a real colorful personality and a really nice guy that people could sense when they watched him play. And again, fun to watch just because of his dunking ability. And if he stole the ball and had a breakaway, Everybody got excited because they knew what was coming. Now, maybe at some point we'll try to get Darnell on on this uh, on this little podcast as well. But the, maybe you can uh, probably a good idea. Yeah, yeah, he'd do it. Yeah, before we uh, before we get off of him for a second, I, I, uh, I there are rumors that uh, he, not only his jumping ability were was uh, tremendous, but he was able to, according to legend, uh, jump high enough to grab quarters off the top of uh, backboards. <laughs> uh, any recollection of that, or is that uh, urban legend? That's urban legend. I don't think anybody's ever done that. You always hear that story about he could grab something off the top of the backboard. I've never seen it done. I've asked Darnell that question, and he plays coy, says it could have been true. It might have been true. Um, he, but he couldn't do that. For one thing, you know, to actually do that, you've got to take a running start and get right next to the backboard without running into it, that type of thing. And – uh, you know, I've never talked to anybody who said they saw Darnell do it, but that kind of thing always becomes legend. You hear about certain guys maybe in Rucker Park or, you know, from the playgrounds in New York being able to do it, but I just don't think it's ever been done. But what Darnell could do was run to the basket and, and kick the rim. He could put his foot on the rim. Now think about that. That goes back to his high jumping days. And he would do that at clinics. Like, you know, Billy Keller or somebody would have a summer camp and Darnell would go out there and, and uh, kick the rim. And that, to me, is just about as impressive as being able to uh, grab something off the top of the backboard. 
Well, amongst all that, a second straight championship. Uh, did the uh, did the uh, the city uh, regale uh, similarly, and then was uh, the talk of dynasty on people's lips at that point? Yeah, people, you know, definitely were still excited about it. No question, they beat the Nets in 1972, and you know, Rick Barry, of course, is a member of that Nets team. And uh, by the end of the year, George McGinnis is starting. He'd taken over the starting spot from Bob Netalicki. And so you got this rookie, and Roger Brown is still playing at a high level. This is actually Roger Brown's last year as a full-time starter for the Pacers in 72. His body is already kind of betraying him, partly because of age and partly because he didn't take care of it. And, you know, Mel Daniels was a great player. Freddie Lewis was the MVP of that series. And Freddie Lewis, in my mind, is the most underrated Pacer and, and the guy who should have a number retired uh, at the field house today, he was the one who led that championship in 72, but it was a great series, you know, beating New York. Um, Rick Barry obviously had been the big name in the ABA from the very beginning. So I know the fans got really excited about uh, beating Rick Barry's team. And uh, it was, it was uh, another big deal. No question about it. Yeah. And we talked about the importance of, uh, of Rick Barry in uh, our, uh, our previous episode with, uh, with Pat Boone, uh, which we encourage our listeners to go uh, to go seek out because uh, arguably that's episode forty two. Uh, <laughs> obviously, Rick Barry was a big deal, and obvious and in many respects, that was the uh, uh, anticipated uh, uh, future and value of that franchise. Uh, you know, which didn't happen in the in the Oaks's first season, but certainly did in the second season. And then obviously, uh, once he was uh, moved with the team and all that, but uh, obviously, Rick Barry you know, a quintessential all-star in many respects. And, and to be able to defeat a team in the Nets with a, a superstar such as Rick Barry, uh, pretty pretty darn good thing. And, and, and look, this is the second championship in, this, uh, in three seasons. Um, and, you know, going into the 72-73 season, uh, it seems like uh, the, uh, all the pieces were in place to, frankly, uh, continue uh, unimpeded uh, in the years to come. And, and clearly that next year, um, was uh, adventurous, but also uh, yet another championship. However, without Bob Metalicki, right? So he was sold uh, to Dallas. Uh, Rick Mount, after uh, two seasons, was sold to Kentucky for uh, for some bucks and uh, a little bit of change. You had uh, Donnie Freeman come in, an all-star himself, uh, with the Chaparrales. Um, but it's clear that McGinnis clearly stepped up and became uh, not only the force of the team, but a true force, if not the force, in the league this season. Yeah, and the interesting thing about that 72 title is that there were some things going on beneath the surface that a lot of people around here weren't aware of. Uh, you had two players, Nedelicki and Rick Mount, both make, both say publicly they wanted out during the finals. Uh, in the case of Rick Mount, he talked to a New York reporter when the Pacers were in New York to play the Mets, uh, saying he was, you know, I, I should never have come here in the first place. Stick and I don't get along. Uh, and, I, you know, I want out. And that got out in the New York papers. And once it did, it was um, repeated in the Indianapolis papers. And Nedelicki made his trade demand uh, through the newspaper in Des Moines, Iowa, where he had gone to college. He went to Drake. So that didn't get repeated locally. And I, in fact, I didn't even know it until I was researching my book that he had done that. And I was looking through the newspapers of Des Moines and he said, I'm hoping to play for the Colonels next year. And I'm told now that uh, Nedelicki and Mount you know, they lost starting spots. They'd be sitting on the bench over there next to one another, grumbling about their playing time or, you know, pointing out oh, that teammate, you know, he's not playing well. We got to be in there instead of him, that kind of thing. So you had all that going on beneath the surface and yet they still won the championship. So obviously uh, the other players were able to ignore that, but kind of an interesting thing about that 72 title. So they did, you know, slick, I think gladly, uh, got rid of Nedelicki and Rick Mount in that off season. You, and it was, did you, ever, did, going, you ever, did you ever talk to slick about that? And sort of those, uh, those days where, you know, that was happening. Cause it seemed like that, that, that required some deft management, I guess, on his part, given the, their run in the playoffs. Yeah, I haven't really, I mean, uh, I haven't talked to him a lot in the last, uh, you know, six months or so. I mean, I talked to him at games and so forth, and I haven't brought that up specifically, but he, you know, he has told me that, you know, he, 
they got rid of Nedelicki and then Nedelicki was later begging him to come back, you know, bring me back slick, bring me black, please. And he just, he kind of soft sells the problems with Rick Mount. Um, we might to backtrack a bit, Rick Mount, you know, is again, wildly popular is not playing as much as he wants with the Pacers. Slick's trying to manipulate it and start him, but not playing, play him that many minutes. And there was a headline in the Indianapolis star during that 71, 72 season. Imagine this Sunday morning paper, the banner headline in the sports section of the Indianapolis star reads Mount fed up with Leonard's excuses. <laughs> you know, he, and again, uh, the, the, the guy who wrote the story quotes an anonymous teammate who, by the way, was Mel Daniels saying, I don't know what's going on. Rick really didn't get a fair chance, that kind of thing. And so that exploded. And so everyone knew there was trouble with Mount and they just kind of carried on and got through the season. And I think everybody knew that there was going to be a change that summer and slick just didn't want Rick there in the first place. Didn't care for us. Rick's a pretty uh, withdrawn introverted guy. Didn't mix with the teammates, uh, not a physical type of player, not a defender, strictly a shooter and uh, just wasn't slick's kind of player. And again, I think Slick presented having Mount forced on him. So even though Mount had some big games for the Pacers, it was kind of destined for failure. And I think everybody was relieved when uh, Mount was sent off to the Colonels. And again, Mike Storm down in Kentucky, he wanted Mount and uh, he was glad to take him. Well, going into that next season, uh, it looks like the, the, the major addition was Donnie Freeman from Dallas. Um, mm hmm. Seems like there's some real drama there, right? We talked about uh, Slick kicking the ball in the, at the Utah Stars game, and there's some great classic photos uh, of that. And I guess uh, even the uh, uh, the Stars uh, uh, commemorated that uh, that little event in the next game uh, by giving uh, by giving Slick either a plaque or some kind of ball or some kind of recognition for his outburst in the game. So there's some friendly rivalry with the Stars, but um, perhaps uh, maybe you can kind of talk about maybe what's probably most the most seminal moment. Uh, of the 72-73 season, which was uh, the finals against Kentucky. This uh, You mentioned it before, the I-65 series, um, literally culminating in the finals. And, and what a final series it was, right? Uh, seven games and, and, and a lot of drama and fireworks uh, that eventually uh, you know, led to the third uh, championship for the Pacers. But uh, any, any vivid memories of, of that sort of classic series uh, in the finals that year? Yeah, the weird thing about that series was that the visiting team won. Uh, let me see. The visiting team won game one. The visiting team won game three. The visiting team won game five. The visiting team won game six and seven. You know, so home court advantage meant nothing in that series whatsoever. And it was a classic, you know, uh, by this time the Colonels have uh, artists Gilmore and Dan Issel, two Hall of Famers. The Pacers have their collection of Hall of Famers, future Hall of Famers. Uh, Louis Dampier also on that Colonels team. So a uh, great talent in a great series. Um, it came down to game seven in uh, Louisville. It's an afternoon game. And uh, the Pacers, that was George McGinnis' series, really. I think Freddie Lewis was actually kind of position to win the MVP of that series as well, but he got hurt. And then game seven down there, Freddie was injured. Mel Daniels was in foul trouble and McGinnis just took over and scored uh, like 27, 28 points in that game. He wound up getting MVP for that series. And this was George McGinnis really at his best. Not, not, he wasn't the best player he was ever going to be, but he was certainly the best player of that series. And the Colonels had no answer for him. And, uh, again, the Pacers win a championship on the road. They could have done it the previous game up in Indianapolis and didn't get it done. So uh, that's why today, you know, when we, I hear people talk about, oh, home court advantage is so important for the playoffs. You know, I think really, you know, certainly wasn't ever for the Pacers. But obviously it means something. But for a variety of reasons, the Pacers won all their championships on the road or clinched all their championships on the road. So, um, you know, the whole motto that year was three and 73, you know, third championship in the 73 season. And they got it done. And at the very end of that game, um, they, uh, somebody unfurled the banner down there, four and 74. They were already looking ahead to 74, but, uh, certainly that wound up being kind of the last, run for that championship team, the core of that team that won uh, three ABA championships. 
Yeah, I, I, it also though seems to be um, I don't want to call the zenith of uh, of the franchise, but uh, is clearly you know in the in the year or two that follows uh, a couple of other sub- substantial uh, changes, right? I mean, clearly you know the team uh, humming on on many strong cylinders. I mean, bringing uh, you know Len Elmore for example in the next season and reacquiring Neto and McGinnis just pounding it out with just you know uh, huge points and. And rebounds, uh, performances in, in games and whatnot, and and playoff. Uh, you know, they, they never not made the playoffs, right? So, the, so clearly, you know, as a as a product, uh, obviously very strong. But you know, the idea of moving, right? We talked about this in the earlier episode, right? The facility that they were playing at, at the fairgrounds, right? Not necessarily uh, befitting, I guess, a an increasingly popular and uh, major franchise in a league that uh, would not go away. And um, maybe you can kind of give some hints as to uh, some of the broader implications by this new arena that was planned and constructed, I guess, largely because of the Pacers' success uh, in a Market Square arena in downtown Indianapolis, a a home of their own, yeah. league, right? Right, right. The uh, success of the Pacers, you know, made it clear that uh, people thought, okay, they're here to stay. And the Coliseum just really wasn't adequate. The Coliseum was built in 1938, 39. It was kind of a depression era WPA project. Uh, nice facility still is used today um, for hockey and for college basketball. Been remodeled, of course, but it's uh, it was it's a cool building, but just not really adequate. Uh, the capacity was about 9,100. Uh, no, you know, the locker rooms were inadequate. Uh, the sight lines weren't that good, that type of thing. Just not a good modern day facility. So there was talk of building a new place uh, beginning in the early 70s. And there was talk about building something out in the suburbs, out in farmland on the northwest side of Indianapolis. But then Mayor Luger, Richard Luger, who went on to become you know a longtime senator, a very good one, in fact, uh, uh, was the mayor and a young progressive guy. And he stepped in and said, no, 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 we're going to do this downtown. And he got it done. And they built the arena downtown. And downtown was dying, really, at that point. Uh, the shopping had moved out to suburbs. Um, again, the Coliseum was on 38th Street, so 38 blocks north of downtown is where the Pacers were playing. And there just wasn't much going on downtown at all in the early 70s. So uh, Mayor Luger saw this as a way to revitalize downtown, and they got Market Square built and uh, kind of a public type of project. And it worked out great. It opened in the 74 75 season, but um, it obviously had been in the works long before that. And uh, the Pacers were the main reason for that. And that's why you can argue the Pacers' role in Indianapolis being what it is today. I mean, their success got Market Square built. Market Square kind of kicked off downtown revitalization that continues to this day. Uh, you know, some people would argue the Colts wouldn't be in Indianapolis if not for the success of the ABA Pacers because you can connect those dots. So that was crucial. Not crucial, not only crucial for the Pacer franchise, but for the entire city of Indianapolis. But am I uh, correct in in uh, noting that uh, the team also had some financial troubles? It seems that some of the ownership uh, shifted a bit or or significantly uh, when they became uh, involved with another fledgling league, which maybe didn't have as much, um, I guess, impact in 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 the city as much as the Pacers did with the WHA, the Racers, the Indianapolis Racers. Um, any sort of understanding of sort of that situation? Because it seems like that relationship with the Racers kind of uh, got the team perhaps, if not generally uh, off uh, off target in terms of finances, even more so because of that relationship. Yeah, I, I know the ownership changed. I mean, the original ownership group, uh, even when the Pacers are winning titles, they're not making money. And uh, I think these guys were ready to move on and, and uh, not be bothered by it. Uh, I've been told by one of the original owners that he probably lost between twenty and thirty thousand dollars personally of his money, and uh, a new group takes over. And yeah, they they do have the hockey franchise, and I can't tell you a lot about that. I mean, the best memory of the hockey franchise is that Wayne Gretzky played for the Indianapolis Racers back then as a teenager, but um, that's kind of what they're known for today. You know, they had a decent following, but um, 
you know, certainly the ownership group was really stretched thin. Uh, you know, it's not until the Simons by the team in 83 that the Pacers have adequate ownership. So they're still a long way off from that in, you know, the early 70s. Well, it didn't seem to affect the team in terms of its playoff ability. I mean, clearly not nearly near uh, the uh, uh, the success at their at their height uh, in years earlier, right? McGinnis still still making it happen. As a matter of fact, he was the uh, the co MVP of the league with uh, uh, a fledgling Julius Irving in uh, the seventy four seventy five season. But um, you know, and even in the playoffs in seventy five seventy six, terrifically uh, keeping that streak alive, but uh, with a losing record, right? So. Uh, it's clear that uh, now I guess maybe it's really important to maybe put all this in context, right? So as the Pacers sort of um, uh, continue to hold more of their own, despite sort of the ownership challenges, uh, they've got a a huge shot in the arm from not only the city and the region, but with a new facility. Um, You know, it's clear that the finances are wobbly, uh, but maybe you could juxtapose that with where the league itself was at in 74, 75, uh, as it uh, inevitably looked towards uh, some kind of relationship or merger or something with the NBA. Because clearly this wasn't something that just popped up in 76 when it was finally achieved. Um, may- maybe you have a bit of uh, some, for our audience, a bit of a sort of a background of how the ABA was sort of faring and where it wanted to go uh, in the lead up to 76. Yeah, you know, there had been efforts for a merger going back to the er- very early 70s. And in fact, it almost happened, I think, in the, around 1970, 71, and uh, did not. And the ABA was kind of dying a slow death. I mean, the Pacers were a strong franchise. Kentucky was, Utah was, Denver was okay. Uh, San Antonio got things going well, but there just wasn't enough depth to the league. You know, they, the ownership wasn't stable in all areas and uh, there wasn't really enough talent to fill both leagues adequately. So there was growing pressure uh, for that. Uh, But the ABA, you know, the NBA obviously had the upper hand, you know, the ABA was the one that was dying. The NBA was okay. And they were able to kind of write it out and force the ABA teams into a desperate deal. You know, as, as you know, only four ABA teams joined the NBA. Uh, it's not, I guess you call it a merger, but uh, only four teams survived and uh, team franchises were folding. Players were being dispersed. You know, the, the Baltimore Claws, you know, folded and uh, their players were dispersed around the league and it just wasn't working. You know, it was no longer working. Uh, you, you didn't have enough good franchises. So um, it was unfortunate, but it was kind of inevitable as well. How do you think the Pacers made their case to be one of those four, right? That's obviously the team that you knew the most and the best uh, versus uh, the others that maybe didn't make it. How and why do you think the Pacers – Get, and arguably with some shaky finances behind them, how did they make their case and uh, to be one of those four chosen in your mind? Well, they they were the best uh, attended franchise. You know, they drew the best. They had the best fan following. Uh, Kentucky wasn't far behind. Other teams did okay, but they had that. And then, frankly, it came down to being able to come up with the money. There could have been other ABA teams that uh, joined, but there was a $3.2 million entry fee. And you, somebody had to come up with that. And in the case of the Pacers, there was a man named William Easton, E-A-S-O-N, who wasn't really a sports-minded guy, a, a real smart guy who had a company here. Um, and he's the one who wrote the check. And he went to the meeting in New York, and he got it done. And that's what got him in. You know, it wasn't a matter of being approved. It was a matter of having the money to do it. And uh, so you had, you know, Denver and New York and San Antonio doing the same thing, but it really came down with being able to come up with the entry fee. You know, John Y. Brown of the Colonels took uh, kind of a buyout from the rest of the ABA. And there, as people know, the spirit of St. Louis owners got the best deal of all time by agreeing not to be part of the merger. They took a deal where they got one seventh of the television revenue of the four ABA teams that did go in, <laughs> you know, which they still get paid on today. So it really was, you know, basically a matter of uh, coming up with the cash and getting in there. Yeah, that's uh, something we discussed uh, with um, uh, with uh, the producer of the uh, ESPN uh, 
30 for 30 uh, episode uh, devoted to the spirits of St. Louis uh, with our friend Dan Forer. Uh, and uh, we're uh, actively trying to uh, get uh, Dan Silna uh, to kind of uh, regale us with some of the, the, that story behind all of that uh, in the sort of deal of the century, deal of the, uh, the, the, the millennium, I think, uh, for sure. But yeah, I mean, yeah. you look at Kentucky as a successful franchise, right? And uh, I think there are still a lot of people in Louisville who uh, argue that that could have been Louisville's shot at being sort of big league uh, for a long period of time, too, had that buyout not occurred. Uh, but, you know, it's yeah, uh, other people's course. money, right? And you don't know if it's not your money. Uh, you know, you don't uh, necessarily have the right to sort of, uh, I guess, uh, uh, project. But uh, I think a lot of people in Louisville, uh, having lived there for a period of time myself, would sort of argue that uh, that could have been the uh, a seminal moment in the uh, the city's professional uh, ambitions uh, I- itself. Um, so I, I guess maybe the, one of the best sort of ways to kind of uh, uh, conclude our little journey here in the Pacers, I guess, early history, and that being the ABA, was sort of their segue into the NBA, right? Uh, maybe you can kind of uh, give a little bit of a understanding about how that, uh, that first uh, season, uh, bumpy as it might have been, uh, for the four franchises of the ABA, including the Pacers, uh, sort of went. Uh, there is also another, as we've uh, hinted at before, another ESPN uh, documentary, this being a, a shorter variety, ESPN short, uh, about a particular event. I think it was that first NBA season, uh, again, indicative of, I guess, some of the uh, financial hardships of the team uh, as it segue into the NBA, a telethon of all things. Uh, to, uh, I guess, raise not only awareness, but season ticket money, et cetera. Um, I, again, I'm, I'm projecting here, but but what was that sort of transition like going from, you know, arguably one of the most stable, and it's a relative statement, franchises of the ABA into this uh, big uncharted territory of the much bigger and more professional um, uh, legacy of the NBA in that 1976-77 uh, season? Yeah, it was a combination of entering a new league, uh, you know, a stronger league, stronger competition, and being a franchise that happened to be in a downward cycle. You know, the Pacers won their last title in 73. The following year, they came back with that same team again and wound up losing a seven-game series to Utah in the second round of the playoffs. And by this time, Roger Brown's really declining physically, and Mel Daniels isn't quite what he used to be. And that team got spoiled by success. You know, they had all this, uh, you know, all three championships, and they're getting pretty high and mighty, that kind of thing. So they kind of have their last run in 73-74. Uh, the Pacers trade off everybody but McGinnis for that 74-75 season. Uh, they have like a Cinderella run to the finals where they lose to Kentucky in 75. And this was George McGinnis at his peak. As you mentioned, he was co-MVP with Julius Irving. And then McGinnis goes to Philadelphia in the NBA strictly because he could double or triple his salary at that time. And there were no hard feelings from the Pacers, really. They couldn't match the money he was going to get in Philadelphia. Everybody kind of tipped their cap and wished him well. So the Pacers come back in the final ABA season, 75-76, with a much weaker roster. You know, some decent young talent, Billy Knight, Lynn Elmore, Billy Keller is still a Pacer. Darnell Hillman is still here. Uh, But they have a losing record, 39-45, and uh, still make the playoffs in the dying ABA and lose in the first round, Um, and then join the NBA, which is a huge relief to everybody here to be part of the NBA finally and to have new life. And But again, they don't have a really strong roster, and they had to give up their first-round draft pick to get into the NBA. I mean, the NBA kind of stripped – all these four ABA teams down to the nubs, you know, to let them into the league. So the Pacers have a losing record. They're reasonably competitive, but they have a losing record and they get through that first NBA season and they're in trouble financially. You know, they, uh, even though they had sold more tickets in that first NBA season than they did in the last ABA season, um, the expenses are greater. Uh, They're in market square arena. Now Uh, everything costs more and they're losing money. And it turns out, uh, they're told, uh, again, Bob Leonard is the GM. His wife, Nancy, runs the front office as the assistant GM. And they're told that, look, we got to raise X amount of money. We got to sell X number of tickets by this date or, or we're done. You know, the owners are pulling up shop and uh, we're out of here. And Nancy Leonard, 
uh, and this is the documentary you're talking about, the 30 for 30 short, um, organizes a telethon in about a 10 day period, 10 days, two weeks tops, which is pretty remarkable when you think about it. Uh, when she began calling around about, Hey, how do we do this telethon? She called a guy here locally who had done, uh, who participated in that Jerry Lewis telethon, kind of the local branch of that and muscular dystrophy. And, uh, or is it, I think I have that right. Um, uh, he said, you can't do it. It takes a year to do a telethon to organize one. Well, she did it 10 days, two weeks. And, uh, the city really came together on behalf of the Pacers. The convention center was donated. Space was donated there. Uh, Arby's donated food. Uh, uh, players came in and manned the telephone lines to take pledges for people. Uh, kids were literally going around their neighborhoods with piggy banks, collecting money to bring in for the Pacers. Uh, people were invited to come in and entertain. The telethon ran for 16 hours from the evening of July 3rd of 77 till the afternoon of the 4th, uh, about 16 hours. Uh, three of the four local television stations ran at least part of it. You can imagine that, just getting rid of your national programming and televising this local telethon uh, all at the same time. So people had to watch it. Uh, and it was just incredible looking back on it. And they got it done. You know, whatever number of tickets they had to sell, pledges for, or whatever money they had to raise, uh, they got it done and saved the franchise. So uh, something like that had never happened before and i don't think will ever happen again well it it it, it defies uh logic right i mean I, here's a professional team uh with uh arguably unmatched success in the aba right where you know literally looking to the public in a very public way to raise money to stay in town so i it's hard to it's it's hard to believe, and that's why that uh, that documentary short is is well worth worth watching. Yeah, because you well, yeah, of- you know, a professional franchise basically standing on the street corner with its hand out. Hey, brother, can you lend me a dime? You know, it's oh, uh, yeah, this was also, it was it is amazing. This was also the time where the telethon, right? Obviously uh, pioneered by by Jerry Lewis and the NDA, but uh, it was a very strong uh, mechanism by which to raise funds. I mean, if I remember correctly, the Democratic yeah. Party. Uh, one year even had a telethon on television to raise funds. Uh, if you can sort of believe, yeah, it. a different time, a different yeah, time. People different. responded to that kind of thing back then, yeah. But it's my so, but I, but I guess my question really is, where did Bill Eason go or come from? Right, in that you know he's the one who put up the bond, if you will, or the money for uh, getting into the NBA. Um, did he not have the funds to kind of operate the team as well? Uh, where did he get the, the three point two million to? To get that, did he borrow that? Was was that part of the the problem? Uh, any general understanding as to sort of how they got into that financial position so quickly, especially after having convinced the powers that be that they were one of the four franchises that should have been taken by the NBA? You'd think they'd be yeah, started, right? yeah, yeah. He um, he just kind of faded. He, his name was really rarely mentioned, and at the time, it was all behind the scenes. He wasn't. He was a Oh, I don't know. like an engineer type of guy. I think his company is Roach Diagnostics. You know, he invented uh, diagnostic equipment, that type of thing. And so he had a whole lot of money, but he, he just kind of did this as a favor to the city and didn't have interest in being an NBA owner, probably didn't have the money to operate a team, you know, day to day. Uh, I have never talked with him. He's long gone. I've, I have talked to his wife and, uh, uh, you know, she talked about how he was at this meeting in New York and wound up having to stay longer than he anticipated and only had one shirt, you know, this kind of thing. And, uh, but he got it done and then faded back into the woodwork and the new ownership group, uh, just didn't have the money, you know, just to operate it, uh, the way it needed to be operated. And there were players were being sold off, uh, strictly for cash, that kind of thing. Again, they had lost George McGinnis and, uh, there were others they were losing, uh, cause they simply couldn't afford to match salaries. So, yeah, it just—it was just a weird thing again, where Ethan uh, did his little favor and disappeared again, and was really not heard from again uh, as far as the Pacers go. Where, where do you know? Do you remember where the team was rumored to be possibly going and/or purchased by, uh, or is that not really sort of known? Yeah, in '77 there weren't any rumors of where they would go. It was just like we're going to fold. You know, we're we're out of business if we can't 
get this amount of money. Uh, you know, later in 83, they were going to go to Sacramento when the Simons bought him and saved him in 83. Uh, and I've talked to the guy who was behind that effort. And, and he says, I might've kept him in Indianapolis for a while to see how it went. But, uh, this guy wound up buying the uh, Kansas City Kings and moved him to Sacramento. So, um, 77, there were no rumors of where they might go. And it all came up very suddenly. You know, they finished the season. Um, the Leonard's were in Hawaii scouting uh, a all-star game of some kind. And that's where they got the call. Like, hey, owner says we got to raise X amount of money by this particular date or whatever, or we're done. So they came back and went to work. Well, if there are any patron saints of the uh, Indiana Pacers franchise, it's obviously uh, Bobby Slick Leonard and his wife, Nancy. And, um, uh, you know, I I guess we'll maybe sort of end our journey together, uh, Mark, with this uh, with this question is, um, uh, you know, you've covered the team and you've been a fan of the team from its earliest days. You know, the trajectory of the team now, right, obviously some some amazing uh, years in the in the 90s uh, with Reggie Miller, obviously, and then some of those legendary battles with uh, with teams in the playoffs like the, the, the Knicks and Patrick Ewing, et cetera. Um, you know, the team obviously has never um, gotten to that sort of uh, championship mount again, but uh, clearly uh, emblematic of, of a city uh, that uh, still continues to support very strongly and, uh, and arguably has a lot of identity attached to this team. How do you feel the Pacers are set for um, you know, the years ahead in, in an NBA, which is obviously much, much different than it was back in the day. Um, how do you feel about the, uh, the team now and going forward, uh, and its role in the NBA firmament? Well, as you and I are speaking today, I feel good about it. You know, we know how quickly things can change, but they at this moment have a, a good young nucleus. Uh, the fans here like this team. They enjoy watching them play. It's a young team that should get better. You have, you know, Victor Oladipo, who played college basketball uh, at IU. You have Miles Turner, who's 21 years old. Sabonis is a young player. You know, you've got uh, a core that looks like it can get better going forward. And the franchise is also positioned to have money to spend in the off season and and have a means of improving the roster. So you have that and you have Herb Simon still alive uh, and still active as an owner has pledged that this team is staying here and he's going to pass it on to his son, Steve Simon, who is a good guy. Um, So the city, I think feels secure that the Pacers are going to be here. Even if there are some down years, uh, this ownership group isn't, looking to sell out. Um, it's connected to the city in a lot of different ways. I mean, to the power structure, they've taken favors from the city, uh, for, uh, improving Baker's life field house, that kind of thing. So there's a strong relationship and, uh, the, the team will be here. And at this moment, you know, it looks like they have a positive future. Now, again, things do change quickly in the NBA. If we had been talking in 2014, I would have thought, yeah, that team uh, can be a contending team for a few more years. Uh, that team had reached the conference finals for the second year in a row and had years still ahead of it, but a variety of things happened, and that team wound up being broken up. So you never know. But right now, today, things look really good for the Pacers, and the most important thing of all, I think, is that they're going to be here. You know, the uh, People don't have to sweat out the future of the Pacers in Indianapolis like they did at times in the past years. Uh, the team will be here. It's just a matter of how good they can make the team. Well, Mark, this has been a, a great journey, and I think it's also uh, one that's going to continue because it's my understanding that um, uh, Bob Nedelicki, uh Dick Tinkham, and, uh, and, and Robert, uh, Robin Miller, a uh, local journalist as well, have a book coming out shortly called We Changed the Game, uh, which I believe is going to be focused on not only sort of ABA stuff, but obviously Pacers-related stuff too. So I, I can't imagine that... Um, uh, looking back into uh, the history of how this team uh, got started in its early years and, and its fundamental uh, tie to the uh, to the region uh, and the city of Indianapolis specifically uh, can't help uh, but burnish uh, the um, you know the the legacy of this team and how important it is uh, and and you know and its success going forward uh, because obviously without these uh, struggles and these uh, interesting times and it's a franchise that certainly has defied logic on a number of different levels over over the years. Um, you know, I think that's that's kind of important stuff when 
uh, you look at uh, the future as well. And, and to deny the past, right, is, uh, as we know, uh, can always be a, a challenge when, when people look forward and, and ignore what uh, might have uh, been built on, on their backs in the, in the past. So I want to thank you tremendously. Um, now is your golden opportunity for promotional goodness. We uh, obviously promote the book uh, both before and after our, our little interviews and stuff and have before. Uh, but uh, give us a, give our audience a bit of a sense of not only uh, your book about the first two years, but also other things that you're currently involved with and uh, where people can find out more information. Oh, thank you. Well, Tim, I've enjoyed the conversations. And uh, my book is called Reborn, The Pacers and the Return of Pro Basketball to Indianapolis. And it covers the formation of the franchise in 1967, the events that led up to that, and how the franchise got off the ground. Those first two seasons were absolutely uh, crucial to just survival and kind of set the table for the championships that followed. Um, my original intent was to do something on all the ABA seasons, but uh, I've got 400 pages on the formation of the franchise in the first two seasons alone. Uh, a lot of biographical information uh, info in there as well on the some of the characters of those first two teams. So it's been well received. I've been very gratified by the response I'm getting to it. It's available on Amazon.com, on BarnesandNoble.com. It is available uh, at bookstores throughout the state of Indiana, uh, whether that's a Barnes and Noble or one of the others. So it's not difficult to find. And uh, I think anybody who's a fan of the, not just the Pacers, but the ABA would enjoy it. And even beyond that, I think uh, it's just kind of a, it's a human story of uh, people uh, coming together to make something happen. Um, the the heartbreak and joy that goes into being a professional athlete and uh, all the crazy things that can happen. And uh, so hopefully it would be an enjoyable read for anybody who's a basketball fan. And uh, and broadly, uh, your website and, and other things that uh, you have done and, and are doing as well? Oh, yeah. Uh, MarkMonteith.com. Uh, I have um, information about the book there. I have the entirety of another book I wrote called Passion Play. It was a book that came out in 1988 that was an inside look at Purdue's basketball season. I was given total access to that program, uh, going to coaches' meetings, sitting on the bench during games, being in the locker room. That book is in expanded form on my website. A lot of the articles I've written on former Pacers and other people over the years. I also had a radio program for six years uh, called One on One, which I interviewed for an hour, uh, kind of like what you're doing now, uh, aired on the radio, uh, different sports personalities, including many ABA people, uh, many former Pacers. So that's all on there on my website, markmontees.com. And I do want to do uh, a couple more books. I want to do something on the championship years of the Pacers, the years we've talked about. Also on the teams that preceded the Pacers, you know, the pro basketball story in Indianapolis really goes back to the early 30s. And I'd like to do something on those because back in the day, I talked to the guys who played on those teams in the 30s and 40s. A lot of crazy stories from those years, as you can imagine. So I do want to do a book on that as well. So uh, I plan to keep busy for quite a while. All right, you Pacers fans, you can't say that we haven't given you enough love on this here show. Mark Monteith. Uh, we thank you tremendously. Uh, Mark's book, again, is called Reborn, The Pacers and the Return of Pro Basketball to Indianapolis. It is the first two years, really, of the ABA version of the Pacers when they first started with that fledgling league. And as you heard from Mark, uh, there are more books in him to come. Uh, and in particular, much of what we talked about today, uh, the years after uh, those first two years, as well as its uh, entree the Pacers into the NBA in 1976-1977. So we uh, look forward to seeing that book from Mark in the uh, months to come, uh, and we'll absolutely have Mark back to uh, uh, to promote that uh, if and when uh, it is ready to, uh, to do so. We also want to remind you that uh, Mark's overall website, where not only you can purchase the book, although you can find the link for that, of course, on our website at goodseatsstillavailable.com. Just search for episode uh, number 45, or frankly, also don't forget to go to uh, episode 41, which was our first interview with Mark. Uh, but uh, Mark uh, does other things in life, too, including uh, beat reporting for uh, the Pacers uh, today. Uh, he's got other books out there, as he's uh, mentioned, one called uh, Passion Play, a uh, season with the Purdue Boilermakers back, back when they were uh, coached by uh, legendary coach Gene Cady. Mark's got a whole bunch of other stuff. He's got a very uh, touching story about his uh, his battle and survival with cancer. 
Uh, his website is Mark Monteith. That's M-O-N-T-I-E-T-H, markmonteith.com. Uh, that's where you can find out more about all that Mark does and will, is uh, continuing to do. And uh, keep in touch with him uh, directly if you'd like. And perhaps if you've got some, uh, some stuff, some stories, some input about uh, the later years of the ABA version of the uh, Pacers, uh, he may just indeed uh, appreciate that as he uh, puts his work together for that hopefully upcoming next book. Uh, for us, uh, we want to thank, of course, our friends at uh, Audible, audibletrial.com slash goodseats. Don't forget to get your free one month uh, version of the service and a free audiobook download. Sportshistorycollectibles.com. Don't forget to use your co- promo code goodseats uh, for your 15% discount there. We want to thank our friends Podfly Productions, uh, in particular, Jerry Payne and the boys and girls at uh, podfly.net. And again, if you want uh, some help uh, in getting going with your own podcasting stuff, including production, etc., or you just don't know where to start, podfly.net. Tell them that Tim Hanlon and or Good Seats Still Available sent you, and uh, I'm sure they will be more than happy to guide you in the right direction as they have me over the last year or so. Uh, and for us, if you want to follow us, please do. We love your uh, tweets and your comments and all that kind of stuff. Make sure wherever you listen to us, uh, that you rate and review uh, generously, especially if it's positive. We always appreciate that. That helps our algorithms, whether that be on iTunes or Google Play or all the other various places that we're available, wherever you pod, as we say. And on social media, let us know where you are and, and, and uh, if you're enjoying the show. On Twitter, we're at Good Seats Still. Uh, on Instagram, you'll find us at Good Seats Still Available. And uh, in Facebook land, you will find us uh, a page devoted to us as well. Uh, about the show. Uh, Just find us when you search Good Seats. It's still available there too. Okay, I'm done. Thank you so very much. I appreciate your listening. More good stuff next week. Take care and we'll talk to you then. 